One billion people have no access to safe water. Two and a half billion already face drought. Four and a half billion will face drought by 2050, so you're in the right business. But China uh, it, uh, alone faces a crisis which is beyond its capacity to solve. And just look at the Tibet issue. In 20 years alone, China has lost 18,000 square miles of ice cover. 3,000 out of 4,000 lakes in Tibet are dry. The Yellow River dried up recently for, for most of a year. It could be said that the river at that point was completely dead. This is today, you tell me, tomorrow. China is only at the very start of the water revolution. I wonder what calculations you would make in China for the amount of water each person will need by 2030. In the European Union, we use the figure of 150 euros per day. But actually, this is completely wrong. That only applies to the amount we use for washing, cooking, uh, cleaning, and so on. If we consider the amount of water that my life has used today, it is probably at least four and a half tons. Why? Because of the products which I consume and the food which I eat. At lunchtime today, if we look at this chart here, a single tomato which you ate uh, 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 consumed 13 liters of water. Uh, put your hands up if you had a roll at lunchtime today. How many rolls did you have? Did you have a low roll? A roll. Two rolls. Sir, you just used a roll is 100 liters. Uh, so uh, 200 liters of water. You had a tomato too. Oh, yes. Uh, that's 213 liters for lunch alone today. Uh, how does it feel to be a mega water user? Now, does it matter? Yes, it does. Can we make some huge savings here? Yes, we can. Is it enough just to think about water conservation? No, it isn't. Is it enough to think about water saving taps? Crazy. It's almost irrelevant. We need a water policy that creates a total picture of national water use, not just inside the nation, because a lot of this water is water that has been used in someone else's nation even though we've consumed it in this nation. I'll come back to that. Despite this extraordinary figure of four and a half tons of water I use today, 25% of all the water delivered to my home is wasted every single day. Uh, I went to Russia uh, recently, and in the center of Russia, I, uh, I visited a friend in an apartment. I went to wash my hands. I was looking for the plug. Um, actually, I was also looking for the tap. Uh, the water, the hot water was running continuously. The tap was broken. I said to him, uh, um, he said, no, no one bothers with taps, he said, because it's all free. And of course, the water is heated from the local power station, uh, so no one's metering it. It's just, he said, don't drink it, but it's free. So there are huge opportunities everywhere we look, whether it's in London, whether it's in Moscow, to radically rethink how we use water. Agriculture is another area. I think that water utility companies are going to find themselves in farming. I don't just mean delivering to farms, I mean managing the contracts. We are seeing new markets develop, as you know, just like the carbon trading market, the water trading market. We're seeing water trading markets in individual uh, uh, groups of farms, where they're trading their own water permits in Australia, in California. This is the future for us. Many utility companies tell me, they say, we can't get people to really value water like they should. And when we try to charge them what we think is the real value of making water in a sustainable way, then we get a public reaction. That's true for the consumer in the town. But outside, we have a water market that's already creating a constantly floating uh, supply and demand private arrangement pricing mechanism for water, which I think is interesting. Dams. 
Dams have had a lot of bad publicity over the years, which is a big pity, because one of the nations which has most attacked dam building in the poorest countries is the United States. The United States has more dams than any other nation in the world, and yet has been quite politically opposed, uh, uh, ecologically opposed to big dams being built by China, India and the rest. But of course the US has their own Hoover Dam and lots of others as well. Um, there are 78,000 small dams, medium-sized dams in the US alone. Many of them need repair. The surface area of all dams in the world is 400,000 kilometers of water, square kilometers of water. And we will see many more. It's a cheap and easy. I know uh, we can argue about the damage to environment further downstream as well, but dams have a vital part to play in our future. It's very easy for people in Brussels to point the finger, but I have been, I spend a lot of my time in Africa, in Asia, in places with severe drought as part of my humanitarian work. I tell you this, when you see cattle dying in the fields, and you see that no one bothered to dam the stream when the floods came eight weeks ago, you tell them to dig a hole. Passion, emotion is really important in driving the future. If we want to understand what public policy will be on dam building, we need to understand how emotions will ride in the future in some of these nations. The equivalent of uh, what British Sugar has been doing is being seen in hundreds, as you know, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of situations where companies are changing the business which they're in. So are they becoming competitors for you? Yes. Intel is one of your competitors now. In China, the city, they use two million uh, gallons of water a day. So they decided to set up their own desalination and repurification plant. And they capture, recycle, purify, and convert to drinking water one and a half million gallons a day. Does it matter? It's part of the picture. A picture of governments, of communities, of farmers, of businesses, all working together to solve fundamental challenges in partnership together. Desalination, innovation, and so on. And once again, very political. Conflicts over water. I've been talking about the risk of water wars for some time. If you look at the Danube, not necessarily water wars, but water conflict, if you look at the sheer number of nations touched by the Danube, if something terrible happens to the water discharges in the Czech Republic, it affects, as you can see here, Austria, Slovakia, Hungary, Serbia, Romania, uh, Croatia, and all of these nations get affected. What about uh, treaties being violated uh, that happened recently. Uh, the Uganda government is bound by a treaty regarding the flow of the River Nile, which is shared with, uh, su uh, with Sudan, of course, and Egypt, but without any consultation. The government decided one single day to turn off the entire flow of the Nile by 33%. Why? Because the fishermen were having to walk 100 meters from the side of the lake to get to water deep enough to launch their boats on Lake Victoria. And why was that? Because of power. Uganda had been sucking so much water out of Lake Victoria, much more water than had been going into the lake, and had pushed too much water down the Nile at earlier stages, earlier years, so the water level had fallen. So once again, we see power supply, hydroelectric policies, we see irrigation, we see manufacturing, we see all of these things linked together in a, a way which is uh, impossible, I believe, for one corporation or one government department to disentangle. I want to come back, uh, um, just before looking briefly at recycling, at uh, the issue of virtual water, which I find fascinating. Now, we looked at the four and a half tons of water which I used yesterday. Most of that is imported water. Uh, here's a strange thought. Egypt grows a lot of wheat, but is a desert country and is short of water. 
Let's do the maths here. For every kilogram that you grow of wheat, you need a cube.